Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and give folks about a minute or so um, to hop on. We have a good amount of people that have registered for this event, so um, we'll just hold tight before we get started. So thank you so much again for attending and um, looking forward to, to learning alongside each of you. Okay, so that minute went by really fast. Um, all right, so we'll go ahead and officially get started for the presentation today. So again, welcome. I'm going to go ahead and do a quick introduction um, and overview of the control panel um, before we get started. So my name is Alejandro Del Toro and I am the Education and Community Coordinator at Empower Idaho. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with Empower Idaho, we offer education and advocacy um, for the community for adults with behavioral health conditions in Idaho. Um, some of the events that we do are just like the event that you're attending right now, um, which is a free informative um, presentation from our wonderful subject matter experts. So today we'll be learning from um, Christy Schmidt. Um, she is a nurse amongst so many other things at St. Luke's. Um, and she will be presenting the Making Your Voice Heard, Communicating with Your Mental Health Provider presentation. Um, you'll see here that we also have Fran, who is the ASL interpreter that is assisting us today. Um, if you are um, in need of um, viewing those, uh, viewing uh, Fran's interpretations, you can um, hover over her webcam and click the arrows and it'll enlarge that photo um, for you as well. Um, so for the control panel, um, you'll see that you are all muted and don't have access to a webcam. So the way that you'll communicate with us is through the questions drop down box. Um, please input any of your comments or questions in there. Um, we'll be able to see those as though those flow in and um, just depending on how we're doing on time, we'll either um, answer them as we go or we will also save um, some time towards the end to answer questions. Um, you will also see under the handouts drop down box, we have a PDF copy of the slides that Christy will be going through today. Um, we have a slightly updated version with um, some updated resources um, that is available as well. Um, but please just send me an email there to adeltoro at janice.org. It's listed there on the screen um, and I can definitely send you that copy. Lastly, um, this session is recorded and will be available on the Empower Idaho website within the next few business days. Um, so be on the lookout for that. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and uh, carry that over to you, Christy. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody's time this evening. I'm really honored to be able to be speaking with all of you on communicating with your uh, mental health care providers. A little bit about me, as Alejandra mentioned, um, I'm a nurse. I've lived in Boise for about 13 years. I've uh, been a nurse for almost 20. I graduated from the University of Alaska Anchorage with my bachelor's degree and Boise State University with my master's degree. I've got some different letters behind my names, which means I have certifications in project management, nursing leadership, and in patient experience. I've uh, worked in a lot of different places and settings over the years, including helping um, people and patients with substance use concerns and also pe people and patients um, receiving care for mental health care needs. Um, as Alejandra mentioned, I am with St. Luke's in a leadership role under our nursing and patient care services uh, team. And some of my responsibilities in that role are to help bring the voice of the patients and families to the forefront and to ensure um, we're advocating for improvements for patients and families receiving care. 
On a personal note, I'm also the family of a family member of someone who's uh, receiving some mental health care treatment and services, and I've been helping them navigate that so um, I can um, empathize with some of the challenges some of you might be facing as family members. And also, certainly over the last couple of years, those of us in um, healthcare have had some ups and downs. So also might um, be able to relate to some of you having some new or additional challenges over the last couple of years. So to cover our goals this evening, um, I'm hoping that you find our time together helpful and informative. I am hoping you might learn something new or you'll hear something that you're already doing and it'll reinforce the, the idea and that, um, that practice that you're already doing. I'd like to offer some good tips on how your interactions and time with your um, mental health care provider can be improved with communication. And you can probably apply those tips and tools to other healthcare settings and teams and providers. They're, they're a little universal in that, um, in that respect. Additionally, there'll be some tools that you might be able to utilize between visits or when you're starting as a new patient with somebody. I'd love to impart some wisdom and empowerment to help you advocate for yourself or your family member when you're um, navigating a complex system like healthcare and really trying to find um, good mental health care services. It can be a little overwhelming and confusing. So hopefully some of the things we talk about tonight will help you feel like you're in a little more control of your mental health care and give you some good communication techniques that might help you or those you love. And lastly, I just hope you feel a little better than when we started, even if that's a little more confidence or hearing or seeing something that might be helpful to you. Um, that would be a great gift that I could give to you. And certainly you all are giving me the gift of your time this evening. So I really appreciate that. So I think before we dive into um, the, the um, bulk of the communication content this evening, uh, it's really important that we recognize and acknowledge and reflect on some things that I'll be discussing during this talk and some issues you might be facing when you're dealing with your mental health or trying to get the help that you need. So just wanted to take a moment to talk about some of those things. So first of all, if you only remember one thing that I say this evening, I want you to remember this. And that is that you matter and your mental health matters. Um, your mental health care team it should be there to help support you. And for everybody, that might mean different things at different times. I really want to give you a message of hope tonight, and you can carry that with you. The second thing I just wanted to um, acknowledge is some of the terminology that I use. I frequently use the term patient and family because I'm a nurse. And because um, some of the things that I've researched and studied, we'll talk about patient and family-centered care tonight, uh, but just wanted to acknowledge that. Sometimes patient might not quite describe you, and sometimes family um, might not quite um, fit into your, your uh, terminology this evening either, but family is really meant to be an interchangeable term in whatever support system um, you might have, whoever that might be, and whatever that might look like. I also tend to use terms like clinician, provider, doctor, and advanced practice providers, including nurse practitioners and physician's assistants, including doctors are all kind of under the scope of what I refer to when I talk about clinicians or providers. So I'll try and stay on track there and just use the term provider as much as I can. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge access to care in Idaho. Um, I probably don't need to say this, but I'm sure all of you know that historically Idaho has been a challenging place to receive mental health care services. Last year in February, the National Alliance on Mental Health published a fact sheet for the state of Idaho, and that um, told us a few things about the state of mental health care here in our state. About 40% of adults um, in Idaho reported depression or anxiety, and about 25% of those adults were unable to access therapy or counseling services. Over 300,000 adults in Idaho have a mental health care condition, and over 70,000 of those folks have a serious mental health issue. About 26,000 kids in our state ages 12 to 17 have depression, and 1.2 million people in Idaho live in an area or a zip code or geographical place where there aren't enough mental health services for the people that live there. 
Historically, Idaho is ranked pretty low on the report cards when we're talking about um, rates of need compared to access of care. So between funding, um, cost, access to care, provider availability, insurance status, all those different things, sometimes getting the help you need isn't easy. And when you do get the help that you need, sometimes you don't get a choice in the matter. You have to take whoever is accepting new patients. Sometimes that might work out really well. Sometimes it might be a little bit of a harder relationship to navigate. So hopefully I can give you some tips on how to um, deal with some of those things too. And talk about some difficulties in navigating and frustration. I don't think we can uh, move on without acknowledging um, the last couple of years in the pandemic and the need for mental health. Just nationally speaking, we've seen um, in some of the statistics that one out of three adults in our nation are experiencing worsening mental health care symptoms um, and that hospitalization rates and access to telehealth services for counseling have increased um, drastically. Some rates are over 200%. So certainly Idaho is not immune to that. The pandemic has accelerated the need for mental health care services. So um, access to care and other things that have historically been challenging in our state, um, there may be even more challenges in this space. So I just wanted to acknowledge that too. And lastly, I think it's really hard, really important that we acknowledge vulnerability. It takes a lot of strength and is sometimes to hard, hard to talk about issues we might be dealing with. So I've got a couple of tips and tools that hopefully you'll find helpful when you're talking about sensitive topics or tough things. So I think it's just important to reflect on some of those things. We're all trying to navigate an imperfect um, system that is healthcare. There can be a lot of potential barriers that can be tough. Um, people listening in might be in a lot of different places in this space from being connected with a mental health care provider for a long time and having a really good relationship to just starting with somebody or even having difficulty accessing care. So in that imperfect world, we do have ideals in healthcare that we try to live up to, including making sure patients and families are part of their care and have a voice and the ability to make good decisions about their health. That standard of care is called patient and family-centered care. So what does it mean to be patient and family-centered? We say in healthcare, it's a team sport, and it's really important that patients and families are part of the team and not on the sidelines. Patients and families are allies, especially when it comes to making sure they're receiving high quality and safe care. There are a few concepts about making sure patients are at the center. I think it's really important to cover. And remember, this is your mental health. It really is all about you. So those four items on the side of the slide, information sharing, collaboration, participation, and respect and dignity are part of that patient-centered care. And that's really grounded in the partnership between healthcare providers, your healthcare providing team, might be a counselor, or a social worker, a therapist, and patients and families. And it really tries to um, redefine how some of those historic relationships in healthcare have been. So um, historically, in, in a lot of parts of healthcare, um, doctors have really been um, in a place that they may have in the past told the patient what to do, and the patient li listens and doesn't question and just does what they're told. Well, patient and family-centered care really aims to kind of equalize that and create a partnership and collaboration between a physician or provider and the patient and family. Patient and family-centered care leads to better outcomes, improved health, and uh, improved experience for both patients and families and clinicians. The key goal is really to promote health and well-being of individuals and families and help them maintain control of their mental health care whenever possible. So that first concept about information sharing, that's really about the expectation that a healthcare provider is communicating and sharing complete and unbiased information in a way that's helpful, useful, and affirming to patients. So patients need to receive accurate, timely, and complete information in order to make good decisions about their care. Um, an example of this would be if your provider were to recommend you starting a new medication. That provider would talk to you about the risks and benefits, why they think that medication might be right for you, what potential side effects or interactions that medication may, um, may create, and answer any questions or concerns you might have. 
From there, you really have the information you need to make a good decision alongside your provider to determine what's right for you. And information sharing is really a two-way street. And we'll talk about how to make sure the information that you are sharing with your providers um, will help them help you. That second concept is really around collaboration, and that's multiple people working together with a common purpose to achieve a goal, your goal, right? So in terms of mental health care, an example might be that a psychiatrist or psychologist, social worker, counselor, case manager, and you are all working in concert to find the right therapeutic approach or treatments that'll help you stabilize and reach your goals. That's a lot of people, so everybody working, working together and being on the same page is really important, and um, that's incredibly beneficial to patients at the end of the day. Participation is also an important concept. It's about everybody on the team, including you, being uh, taking part in being an active member in their care. Patients should be encouraged and supported in participating, which means they're involved in conversations, information is shared, um, all those things with decision making, they're included in, and important facts and, and information are, are um, transmitted to the patient and, and they're included in that information. We'll talk about some more ways that you can participate in your own care um, with your providers and especially between visits. And then lastly, but most importantly, I think is respect and dignity. I think that's such an important concept, especially when we're talking about mental health given the fact that there has historically been some stigma around receiving mental health care services. Um, really, respect and dignity includes healthcare providers honoring and taking seriously your issues, your values and beliefs, culture, background, trauma, and decision-making capability. Again, there can be a lot of stigma associated with um, receiving mental health care services. So making sure patients feel valued, safe, and heard is really important. It's also important because respect and dignity really builds relationships and trust, and that often times can impact the overall outcomes of how well a patient does. So all of these concepts really lead themselves to shared decision making. And I think that's really important in the mental health care space due to the fact that historically, um, people with mental health issues may have been considered to be unable or unwilling to participate in decisions about their care, treatment, or goals. Care decision-making is a practice that's been endorsed by the Institute of Medicine, and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration supports the use of shared decision-making as a part of routine mental health care. Shared decision-making is all about helping patients take an active role in their care, ensuring people understand complex issues and information, considerations and discussions about treatment options, ultimately resulting in informed collaborative decision-making. We'll discuss this a little bit more when we're talking about tips and tools. What we know is that in healthcare, patient-centered care and shared decision-making are the ideals and what we would like to see happen in medicine every day. This is really the type of care that patients and families deserve. Unfortunately, we don't always do a good job of remembering or carrying out these concepts and approaches to care with the people that we're caring for. A lot of times, poor communication issues and complex systems are at fault. So what are some of those um, known communication issues in healthcare? We know that there's a lot of improvement, um, especially in this space with how um, healthcare providers communicate with their patients. In fact, a study from 2020 by the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research showed that 40 to 80% of medical information that patients are told during an office visit is forgotten immediately. And only half of what um, information is retained is retained correctly. So that's pretty startling when we start to think about it. Why is that the case? Well, I really think it comes down to communication skills or lack thereof. You would think as part of training for doctors, nurses, nurses and medical professionals that there would be um, entire classes and semesters dedicated to good communication techniques, but that's not always the case. And actually studies show that even as a student in medical school is going through their training and then becomes independent to take their own patients, 
um, that their um, communication skills can possibly deteriorate. Meaning if you had good communication skills coming into school, they might not be intact or may have been lost over those years that you were in your training. So there's actually an adequate training for healthcare professionals when it comes to even some of the most basic and fundamental communication skills out there. Things like active listening, meaning that you're fully present, distractions are set aside, you're listening with all senses possible, um, and you're really paying attention to what's being said before uh, mentally jumping to uh, conclusions or solutions in your head. That's a really important concept, and we um, don't always do a great job at making sure we're really listening to what our patients are telling us. Reflective phrasing, which means that you're asking for clarification or confirming what was said with your patient. So it oftentimes looks like looks like this. If I'm understanding you correctly, or just reaffirming and making sure that you're understanding what a patient has told you. Avoidance. So it wasn't that long ago that most doctors actually considered it inhumane and detrimental to tell patients bad news if they had a poor prognosis or if they didn't have a lot of treatment options. So we tended to withhold hard information from patients, thinking that that was more beneficial for them than giving them maybe the full um, scope of information that they needed about their own healthcare. Nonverbal cues. Body language can be really important. Sometimes what isn't said is just as important as what is said in communication. And sometimes we don't pay very close attention to um, body language. It can give us a lot of information about um, patients, if they're anxious or if they're closed off. Other verbal cues with your head shaking and, and things like that can be really um, um, insightful about what is uh, what is not said and can clue um, providers into ask important questions or follow up with things. Open-ended questions, that's another really important thing. We tend to ask a lot of questions that are, are closed off or um, phrased in a way that you only can really answer yes or no. Um, phrasing a question like, that new medication you started is working really well for you, right? Uh, there's only usually two ways to really answer that question versus saying something like, tell me about how that new medication is going for you and allowing a patient to give more information about what they might be experiencing rather than just a simple yes or no to a question. Another poor communication skill interruption. This is really fascinating. There was a study done in 2018 that showed on average providers interrupt patients within 11 seconds of talking. And those that weren't interrupted were finished talking within six seconds. So we tend to jump in really quickly even when a patient is trying to say something to us and we miss parts of stories or important information that somebody is trying to convey. Medical jargon. It's like a second language, and I may have already used medical jargon even in this talk. It's um, something that's really important. I'm trying to be really conscientious not to do that, but healthcare professionals use acronyms, terminology, other things that are really second nature to us, but the problem is there's not really an interpreter for that medical jargon, and oftentimes information might be lost or misconveyed to patients when they, and they don't understand. They don't have the same language. So another um, important thing to talk about is awareness and insight. And I really want to talk about perception because I think that's really important. And that's really the way that you understand, regard, or interpret something. So I'm sure all of you have been in situations or conversations where somebody told you something and you interpret it much differently than what they mean and it created um, miscommunication. Well, that's also um, very alive and well in health, the healthcare world. And oftentimes perceptions with communications, uh, doctors perceive that they've communicated well and patients perceive they haven't. Some of the studies out there show that doctors rate themselves 50% higher when they've been asked if they've satisfactorily um, communicated with a patient compared to the patient's rating of that physician. So we make assumptions about the fact that patients understood us without really actually taking the time to potentially verify it. There's also um, something called the authority gradient, which is part of perception, which means it's whoever's 
got the most power or control in a room. And again, historically in medicine, that really tended to be physicians. Um, if you go back generations, even our my grandparents' generation, it was really a situation where they saw the doctor, the doctor told them what to do. Again, they did it without question. That was just kind of the way it was. So it really should be um, leveling of that authority gradient and a uh, provider should be a partner in your care alongside and beside you. Perception of time is a really important thing to talk about too, I believe, because oftentimes providers seem rushed, they seem in a hurry, they're thinking about their next task. Um, and this can really be detrimental to patients because it um, abbreviates conversations or discourages questions being answered when a provider might kind of have one hand on the doorknob to leave and you're still looking for clarification or information. And lastly, um, distractions. So many distractions in the healthcare space um, from cell phones and messages to electronic health records and computers task lists, all of these things that are coming at us every day, it can really create a lot of distractions and that actually reduces the amount of awareness and um, active listening and just being fully present when you're with your patient when you're in front of them. So um, what's, what are important issues that result in this and what's really at stake? What are the consequences when we're talking about all of these issues? Well, the first is that your provider might not actually hear you, and that means you might not get what you need out of that interaction, or you might be on a different page with them. Um, you might not understand what's said to you, and you might not know what's important for you to do or why you need to do that. You might not know what the next steps are in your care, so you might be kind of left out of the loop a little bit. You might interpret something differently than what was said um, and a mistake could be made and that can be really potentially harmful. Ultimately, communication issues in medicine lead to poor outcomes, poor understanding and potential errors, which could be really harmful to a patient, say, if they didn't understand how to take a medication correctly. There's a great quote from an author and speaker, Simon Sinek. He says, Communication is not about saying what we think. Communication is about ensuring others hear what we mean. And I would add, it's also hearing what others are saying and meaning too. So what can we do about all of this? How can we participate in our care and be good communicators so we stay informed, make good decisions, and get one step closer to meeting our health goals? Well, I'm glad you asked. So. The few things I'm going to talk here about here are really the tips and tools. Um, so first, I wanted to cover writing things down. Uh, I think this is just such an important, simple concept, but really important. I don't know about you, but sometimes I think of a question to ask my provider. I keep it up in my head, and I try to remember when I go to the office or I completely forget about it until later on. So writing things down can be really helpful, whether that's keeping a small notebook um, just for questions that you might want to take to your provider's office, the, the old pen and paper method. Also, um, smartphones often have applications that can help take notes. I actually keep a note on my phone just for my provider so that if I have questions or things come up, I can just drop my note right into that feature and I can pull it up when I'm in the office with my provider. Voice recordings can be helpful too. I take a quick recording on your phone and you can recall that later um, if you don't think you might remember it. Also, some of you might um, like to journal, sometimes leaving a few pages at the end of your journal just to write questions as you might think of things as you're journaling could be really helpful. Also, writing information down actually when you're in your doctor's office or talking to your provider, that might be helpful too. And actually physically writing things down when you're getting information from them, they can see what you write and that can be a way of verifying that you've understood and they've um, sent the correct message to you. Uh, journaling and guided journaling can be really helpful. Some of us love to write, and we write many paragraphs and pages, and that can be really helpful and therapeutic to get information out. Another um, approach to this is guided journaling. If you don't necessarily like to write a lot, you can write some really simple things, just a daily log about how your day was on a scale of one to five, maybe two or three words about your mood and a sentence about the day. 
doing that can kind of help keep track of things over time. Sometimes when we're in crisis, we might not see that we've been making progress over time when we've had a bad day or there's a bump in the road. It can also help us if we're not making progress and we're struggling, we can use kind of that objective information to refer back to, which can be helpful as you're tracking things. Sometimes even taking that with you to um, talk to your healthcare provider might be helpful. Pre-visit planning is really good, especially if you're seeing a new provider uh, for the first time. So uh, oftentimes when you go to see your provider for the first time, you get handed a clipboard and it's got many pieces of paper and you've got a short amount of time to recall a bunch of information, things like medications, um, health information or history, family history, allergies, all that kind of stuff is really important for you to keep track of. And there's um, a great um, uh, link in the resources uh, section of the slides that Alejandra uh, sent to all of you. Um, and that's from the National Alliance on Mental Health. They have a downloadable guide that actually has some great templates that you can take with you or refer back to when you're starting a new visit with a provider. So that's a great reference tool. Uh, the next is just talking about it. And that might seem pretty obvious, but um, what you say and how you say it can be really important. And some things that we talk about, especially with mental health, can be really tough to say out loud. It might be um, a sensitive topic or situation. So um, there's some just some key tools about talking about things that can be helpful. Back to that concept I talked about before, the shared decision making. Again, this is a process that aims to keep people informed with objective information help them make the best decisions they can about the treatment plan that's right for them. It's more than just a conversation though, it's really a set of specific tools to help you understand complex information, consider and discuss options that you might have and make good healthcare decisions. Some of those tools can be really helpful when you might be faced with a lot of different treatment options, when something might be new or experimental, or we call it off-label use in medicine, um, when you're taking a medication that's designed um, for a way and you're using it a little differently under the guidance of your provider. Also, when you're faced with a decision and you're in a position that you might have to make some trade-offs, we call that risk-benefit in medicine. So um, when you're trying to make some of those hard decisions about what might be right for you, even when there's some hard things surrounding it, I'm sure decision-making guides can be really helpful. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration actually has some really great tools on their website that offer shared decision-making guides specifically for mental health care. Some of the specific tools on that site include decision aids and reports. Those are really cool because the information you put in creates a custom report for you. It helps organize thoughts, it records your preferences, your experiences, your concerns, and really what's important to you. So I thought those were really neat. There's some other tools that are cool tools and they're actually called cool tools on um, that website too. And those are guides on all sorts of different topics, like how to talk about difficult things with your mental health care provider, reflections on uh, medications, medication side effects, um, anything that includes mental, emotional, or physical side effects you might be experiencing, questions on medications, alternative um, therapies and understanding and uncovering treatment options, and guided journaling, again, specific to mental health care treatment. I made sure to put those couple links in the resources that are part of the um, information that Alejandro shared with you also. Again, that's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Care Services Administration shared decision-making tools. One of the cool to tools that I thought was especially helpful was how to start difficult conversations with your mental health provider. So approaching topics like respect, partnership, decision making, those are all on that tool sheet. And there are some great ideas or prompts that you can use, change, or adapt based on what you might need to cover and what you might want to address. Some other things that just can help make sure that you're comfortable when you're talking to your provider, especially when there might be some tough stuff that you're covering, is practice saying it out loud. 
sometimes just saying things out loud can be really helpful, saying things clear and bluntly as possible so there's no room for misunderstanding can be a great effective tool. Coping skills like deep breathing or bringing a comfort object to make sure you feel safe and secure when you're covering some of those tough um, topics might be helpful to you. Um, writing it down and reading it might be helpful too if you're um, worried that you're not going to be able to find the right words or you really want to say something very specific. Writing something down and actually bringing it with you and reading it can be um, a great guide. Also, sometimes in certain situations, bringing a support person with you might be helpful. Um, sometimes having an extra set of eyes and ears with you if you're getting a lot of information or you think you might be hearing something difficult. Having a support person with you, again, in those certain circumstances and situations might be helpful. Setting goals, I think, is really important. This is a great way to speak the same language as healthcare providers. Um, we use the term goal setting all the time in healthcare. So even starting out a visit by saying something like, my goal today is get to, my, get to get my anxiety under better control. That can be a really powerful opening statement. And I was able to say that in just a few seconds under the average time of interruption for providers. So also setting near and long-term goals too. Goals for your visit, such as I wanna be able to get my anxiety under better control and goals for future, like by the summer, I wanna uh, not experience any panic attacks that can be a great way to set the stage and drive the conversation everybody's focused on that goal that you have. Saying things clearly and plainly really is the best approach. Um, things that are unspoken or unclear can be really unknown to providers. Oftentimes, again, referring back to that perception of time when patients might be struggling to find the right words. Um, sometimes providers, again, interrupt or get short and that visit is abbreviated and you struggle to find the right thing to say. So just using some of those tools can help get stuff out and really make sure that your provider is on the same page with you. I think it's really important that you make sure you're understood. Again, referring back to that statistic that 40 to 80 percent of information um, is forgotten immediately and half of the information that's remembered is remembered incorrectly. That's oftentimes because we use that medical jargon or we're saying things in a way that somebody might not understand. There's a theory or approach called uh, the five whys. So sometimes even asking why repeatedly might help you get to the core or root of the information and uncover really what you need to know, and that can be helpful. Taking notes, again, during the visit might be helpful. Writing things down and recording them as you're going along um, can be a great resource. Voice recordings, um, just making sure your provider's aware that you're recording the visit so you can refer back to that information can be really helpful to folks too. Use of technology, a lot of providers offices and health systems actually have patient portals that hold a lot of information in them, such as notes, resources, patient education, visit summaries, medication lists, all of those kinds of things. And a lot of those portals actually have a bi-directional communication. So you can actually ask questions to the staff or your provider directly through those portals. And that can be a great way to communicate and get information through or reinforce things that you've already heard in a quick reference kind of way. Um, again, uh, the Ask Me Three tool, kind of going back to that why, but this is a great tool and very simple and easy to remember. Things like, what's my main problem? What do I need to do? And why is that important? Those three questions can be really um, easy to recall um, and can just be great ways to clarify the most important parts of the visit and that you understand what you need to do and why that's important. Just making sure everybody's on the same page there that can be really helpful and reinforce the information that you've heard. Um, the next slide is really about creating a plan and I think that's really important um, during a crisis. So making sure you have a crisis or a relapse plan in place is really important. Some people want to review that, that plan at every visit or as frequently as needed um, based on what they need. 
the National Alliance on Mental Illness actually um, has a great template for a crisis and relapse plan. That link is again in the resources. If you don't have a crisis plan and you need to create one, um, that's a great tool and template and uh, is available for you to download and use. Also, I would just say about crisis plans, a lot of times they're printed and we put them in an important place or on the refrigerator or somewhere we can refer back to. Taking a picture of your crisis plan can be really helpful. So if you're away from home or that important place, you can recall it really quickly on your phone in your photos if that might work for you. Between visits, I think it's really important to know how to keep in touch with your provider and your provider's team. So sometimes just asking them what's the best, easiest, quickest way to get a hold of you. Sometimes a phone call is the best way. Sometimes through that patient portal is easy, quick communication. So just depending on the, the office or the provider, just finding out what the best way to communicate is can be helpful if you're looking to get information back in a timely manner. Making sure that you know between visits and covering these things with your provider can be really helpful. If you're having newer worsening symptoms or if you're having issues with medications, I think those are really important things to ask about what to do in the meantime. Um, your provider might give you some tips or, or say they want you to call right away if you're experiencing some problems. You might refer back to a part of your crisis plan. They might ask you to lean in with your counselor or your therapist. Um, just some different options. So keeping those in mind and having a plan if things don't quite go the way that you want them to between times that you're seeing your provider. Also, again, keeping track of information between visits can be really important. Kind of that journaling we talked about and keeping track of the time between depending on how often you're seeing your provider might give a really clear objective view of if you're doing well, if you're making progress or you're struggling. Um, I think it's also important to just mention to give yourself some grace here. It can take a lot of time. It can take time to establish a new relationship. Um, it can take time to establish therapy, good medication dosages, um, therapeutic levels. Also taking time to actually just um, get used to new behaviors or patterns like journaling or ask me three tools, things like that. Just takes us a little time to build in some of those skills. The more often you use them, the more uh, easy they'll be to recall and they'll just become second nature to you. I think it's also important to know um, or understand anything your provider wants you to pay attention to between visits as well. Maybe that's your moods, your progress with any issues, what's happening in therapy, medication side effects, anything that your provider wants you to wants you to pay close attention to between those visits can be helpful and coming back with that information can really um, kind of again put you all on the same page and um, everybody uh, can start to achieve that goal that we talked about. The next thing is being aware of what's happening at your next visit and when that is. So oftentimes people can get lost to follow up, we call it, so they might not know when to make their next visit or how. So really understanding what your follow-up plan is is really important, I think. When to come back, how to make an appointment, what do you need to do be between those times? Do you need lab work done? Do you need to update your therapist? Do you need to talk with somebody from your support system? I think all of those things are important to remember as we're going to next visit. Keeping your goals in mind, that might impact how often or how frequently you're seeing a provider. Um, if you're starting new medications or new therapies, things like that, you may be seeing your provider um, more frequently. So just making sure that you know that information, I think, can be really important. And keeping your progress in mind. Um, again, you might be in a place that you need to see your provider more frequently or less frequently. So just considering um, where you're at in your treatment and how you're feeling can be really important in making sure that you know what the plan is. So just want to say thank you to Empower Idaho, to Alejandra and Fran for helping interpret. And I'm going to turn it over back to Alejandra to help moderate any questions that may have come up. Yes, thank you so much, Christy, for that awesome presentation. Um, Jam-packed with info, so I'm excited to go back and watch that um, recording. 
Um, so for some closing remarks, um, I we didn't have any questions pop in um, the questions drop down, but if anybody wants to um, type something in or use the raise hand function and I can unmute you, please feel free to do so. Um, so I'll go ahead and hold tight, see if anything comes through. Sure, that sounds great. And I've also included my email, my personal email in these slides. If anybody would want to reach out um, and has any questions they think of later on, I'm happy to um, answer those emails too if somebody wants to email me directly. So thank you so much for being that resource. Absolutely. So I'm not seeing any questions come through. So um, just to quickly wrap up, I want to um, encourage you all to complete the evaluation that will be sent to you right afterwards. Um, this is really helpful for not only our team, but for Christy as well as a presenter to see what went well and what things you want to see for future presentations. Um, also, if um, you're interested in subscribing to our monthly newsletter, I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, and please keep an eye out for upcoming webinars because we have quite a few um, coming up this year. Um, all right, so uh, we got a thank you from Lawrence. Thank you, Lawrence, for um, sharing that. I hope you all have a great night. Thank you so much. Thank you.